right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our virtual workshop. Today, our first webinar is presented by AutoCates, who will be hosting sustainability and resilience advocates from across the architecture, engineering, and construction industry to discuss best practices in cultivating a more holistic view of high performing and resilient design. And now I'd like to hand it over to our moderator for today's webinar. John Williams is the CEO of AutoCase by Impact Infrastructure. He is also the chairman of the board for the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure. Welcome, John. Thank you, Lindsay. And before we begin, I'd like to ask Dr. Joan Zofnos to share a couple of important thoughts for us. Joan and her brother, Paul, as well as their family are instrumental in laying the foundation for sustainable infrastructure through ZHP and ISI, as well as our convening today. Joan? Thank you, John. I would like to momentarily put on my other hat and focus on our inner structure. That is a call for mental health stability at a time when I think most of us are feeling more stress, more anxiety, and the fear of the unknown. In no order of priority, let me provide a few suggestions as to how to take care of yourself and your family during this period. Number one, set up a routine. Even though working from home, some of you are in your PJs still, one can still follow a schedule as to when to get up, when to go to bed, when to have meals, when to work, and when to have relaxation time. Everyone, number two, needs exercise. If you can get outdoors, do so. If you're stuck in an apartment, no excuse not to exercise. It really does reduce tension and stress and it helps release endorphins. It also kills some time too. Number three, try to find some personal space in your apartment or home that is yours and yours alone. Number four, if you have younger children, they may not be able to articulate their concerns, but I promise you they are magnets for picking up our stress and anxiety. Try to reassure and comfort. Scholastic Magazine has a free learning website. And if all is lost, put on the TV, please. <laughs> we are married, number five, for better or worse, but not for lunch. Try to respect that we each cope differently. Some hold in their emotion and anxiety, but take it out on others. Others show their emotions openly. Some family members are not necessarily taking this situation as seriously. If you're on a different trajectory in terms of anxiety and safety, come up with ways to keep yourself safe rather than nagging. Now, teenagers, they're tough, but it is our responsibility to set limits on their high-risk behavior, as going out to hang out can bring illness home right now. Encourage them to hang out electronically, what they wanted to do anyway. Number six, Reach out via phone or computer to check in and share with family, friends, colleagues, and use FaceTime to connect with those whom we cannot hug right now. Seven, make sure you get enough sleep. Also, practice meditation, yoga, other forms of relaxation, and all of those can be found online. Without our own self-care, we are absolutely no good to anyone. Eight, pick up uh, try to find some time to read, pick up a musical instrument, practice a new language on the internet, pick up a book. And I just heard last night that Audible is now providing free access. Make time for yourself. You want to discuss any of these issues personally? Shoot me an email. John, thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Joan. Um, and good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining this virtual conference produced in conjunction with the Zofnis Harvard Program for Sustainable Infrastructure at Harvard's Graduate School of Design, the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure and Impact Infrastructure, the makers of AutoCase software for economic assessment. Our planned presentations will end by noon, but we welcome you to stay on the line for more Q&A until 1215. The entire webinar is being recorded so let's get started. My name is John Williams and I'm a, I am ISI's board chair and the CEO at Impact Infrastructure. I wanna use this introduction as a form of call to arms within the AEC industry 
to get ready to do our part in the battle to recover from the pandemic and the economic slowdown. As such, I'm taking the liberty to rename this session to making the case for responsible stimulus funded infrastructure and buildings. It's not hard to remember our 2008 experience with financial collapse, the rapid movement to stimulus and ways in which the government assistance was opposed, abused and in some cases wasted. Many of the projects that came out of that spending were old style projects, making little if any impact on public concerns for health, climate change, social conditions, and of course, sustainability and resilience. More recently, we saw $1.5 trillion tax cuts aimed at growing the middle class through, for major businesses, through major businesses, excuse me. While there were a handful of one-time bonuses for workers, what actually occurred was a massive wave of stock buybacks. Airlines used 93% of the benefits of those tax cuts for the purpose of uh, buying back stock and not bothering to establish a rainy day fund. Now they're back for more and people are watching. We're in the midst of an election year and eyes will be sharply focused on how the next $2 trillion will be deployed. There are already demands to spend it responsibly, this time including infrastructure and buildings, which are major contributors to carbon. These projects can deliver positive or negative results for society, the environment, and economy. It's our job, it's your and my job, to be sure that our projects are sustainable, resilient, and good for the public. We are on the front lines of making that happen, and it will be up to all of us to prove that we have planned and designed for good, measurable outcomes. We'll be asked to provide objective, transparent, and fully documented economic evidence that our solutions deliver optimal results in the form of social, environmental, and economic returns on investment. There are more than 400 representatives of the AEC community registered for this webinar this morning. As professionals, we're motivated to do our best to assure that future building and infrastructure projects are the product of planning and design that is informed by sustainable practices. That is not enough. In a world facing threats from every direction, we understand that decisions made today can impact the interests of future generations. Again, we are on the front lines. We need to do our best to make use of transparent processes to evaluate the choices we make with the goal of delivering optimal results across the triple bottom line. In the past, it was easier said than done. But fortunately today, we have the benefit of the Envision Sustainability Rating System, as well as access to triple bottom line cost benefit analysis. TBL CBA is a combination of cost benefit analysis, life cycle cost analysis, and triple bottom line project valuation. More than $100 billion in projects have been armed with TBA, C, T, excuse me, with TBL CBA based business cases. Today, you will learn how to use a combination of Envision and TBL CBA to leverage stimulus funding into results that will change the world. This morning, we'll focus on a process for assessing the business case, or more appropriately, the value of benefits, including public good, associated with our, with our design solutions. Our speakers include Eric Bill, who's Vice President of Economics at Impact Infrastructure. He will describe the process in greater detail in context of building and infrastructure projects. Shane Minkley, an auto case account manager, will demonstrate an automated solution for business case and life cycle cost analysis. Anthony Kane, ISI's president and CEO, will talk about the intersection between Envision and economic assessments, including Envision 3.0 Leadership 3.3, which offers up to 14 points for the full use of TBL CBA. 
Carrie Hewitt, Director of Client Services at KLA Associates, will share experience in prioritizing and justifying sustainable capital investments. Jim Grant, Energy and Fueling Systems Director at HNTB, will share experience from using economics to guide investments in sustainable infrastructure. And Lindsay Geiger, ISI's Director of Education, will talk about how you can receive training to achieve Envision economic assessment points. She'll be uh, supported in that discussion by Eric Bill. We built time into the agenda for questions, so please use the chat function to submit them. And we will make electronic copies of each presentation available to you after this webinar. I'll be providing more detail tomorrow afternoon during webinar four as part of my remarks entitled, Where Capital Will Be Coming From and What It Will Expect From You. But for now, let's begin with Eric Bill. Eric? Hey, thanks, John. Good, good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us today. I'm just going to share my screen here, and hopefully it's coming through to everyone. Yep. All right, sounds good. So, um, again, good morning. So, John set the stage for um, really our session this morning, and the intent for us today is uh, to provide the, the lens of economics and, and really some of the background information. I think, you know, for us today and this morning specifically to help paint a picture uh, in the context of infrastructure, real estate, and, and buildings, um, investments, planning, um, to identify just some sample cases where we've leveraged these analytics uh, in the past to really drive a greater value for money in infrastructure projects and uh, really share some of the work uh, that we're engaged in the market supporting planners, engineers, architects, and, and infrastructure owners around North America. So again, my name is uh, Eric Bill. I lead our, our research and advisory work at uh, AutoCase. I'm joined by Shane Minkley, who's gonna run us through um, a really interesting project, a redevelopment of uh, Tropicana Field in, uh, in Florida, uh, along with a quick uh, review of the software. So just to, to set the stage, just wanna talk about the, the analytics uh, that we'll be covering this morning. And really this is the, the context of valuing public benefits in the name of creating rigorous objective um, analytics to support decision making. So this is the concept of, of looking at the life of a project, uh, not just the upfront capital costs, but the life cycle costs, um, replacement costs, operations and maintenance, residual value. These can off, often vary uh, quite dramatically from one option versus the next. And really what we're speaking to is the use of economics to, to better enumerate um, value, understand these trade-offs that exist in product in projects, trade-offs around the public benefits that, that are created. And as John mentioned, um, I, I really feel like with the fiscal stimulus that's gonna be coming down the pike uh, in the near future, um, you know, we, we should have a view to the public benefits created as well as the broader economic implications in it to create long-term value for everyone. And so really it's the context of marrying science uh, with economics so that objectively, defensively, and in an empirical manner, we can quantify and apply monetary values or monetize these broader co-benefits, the social environmental implications that are often uh, the key intent to, to infrastructure projects as well. And, and really what we're doing is leveraging widely used analytics. So these are requirements uh, on the federal side. We've got Executive Order uh, 12866, 13563, so on and so forth, that really require for any proposed regulatory change in, in the U.S. has to go through this valuation, a better understanding of what the merits are, the trade-offs, the benefits to the public versus the cost of those regulations. Now, we're in the business of building business cases and supporting decision-making. Uh, we're also uh, leveraging the, the incredible technology that, that we have today. Right now, we're all sharing virtually. Um, you know, we have um, you know, this great era of technology to leverage. And so even in the, the business case development field, we can leverage analytics and cloud-based computing to quickly synthesize <laughs> complex data and generate um, very site-specific contextual business cases to inform project design and development. You know, as economists, uh, the, the biggest challenge that we have is collecting data 
and building in very site specific or contextually based business cases. So, you know, for us, uh, data is, is king and we've amassed um, you know, a vast repository of information across 5,000 municipalities. And really the, the context here is that projects can be the, the same essentially, but in different locations can drive very different outcomes. Differences in, in the makeup of the power grid drives different emissions intensity factors, differences in, in water scarcity or uh, ecosystem services, the concept of the, the value that projects provide in nature and the differences from, from one place to the next are all highly important in the context of, of economics and developing business cases. Um, you know, often we, we talk about, well, well, how can economics inform projects? And we, we typically find them in, in several different um, use cases. And I think for us again today, it's really just to share some of the projects that, that we've been involved in and, and supporting and, and, and are proud of driving greater value for money in. And typically where we're involved is this earlier stage design planning. So where analytics are used are to help identify out of, you know, let's say multiple high level conceptual designs or various alternatives, which drive uh, greater bang for their buck, for example. Um, often in, in broader um, proposals or other applications to enumerate the value associated with those designs. Um, often as well, once the alternatives have been evaluated, the, the winning alternative essentially selected, uh, there's cases where um, stakeholders and the broader public need to be engaged. And um, this empirical evidence can be used to support that as well. And then the value uh, engineering process, um, often used here to help support greater investment in sustainability and resilience up front by showing those trade-offs long-term uh, and the additional value created. So just generally speaking about where we're seeing interest in, in the market around, get to a wonky light bulb here, there we go, um, in, in how economics is used and, and what's driving some of the interest. I think, you know, in, in the, the broader case, and you know, there's, there's always constraints and economics can really help to optimize outcomes given constraints, budget constraints, design constraints, constraints around the broader interest from the public as well. Um, regulation is often a driver in the work that we do. So new proposed regulations, uh, we've got a few case studies that, that speak to that as well. But I think you know, generally there's more and more interest from communities, from the population to better understand uh, what's in it for me and the value that's being driven to project sponsors, partners, collaborators, and, and the broader public as well. Um, a few more points here. Often uh, these analytics are used to support not only, you know, some of the concepts around discretionary grant funding. So, you know, it, it's a, essentially a requirement for billions and billions of dollars a year to produce these business cases for FEMA's hazard mitigation program, for DOT's infra and, and build programs, for FAA's capacity improvement program, so on and so forth. And so often these analytics are to, to support um, funding outreach and merit-based uh, grant allocation. We feel like that's um, a, a great way to view things with broader public value in mind as well. And at the end of the day, ultimately, uh, these analytics can be used because we're applying monetary values towards implications. We can understand those trade-offs on an apples to apples basis. And, and that's compare different projects, very disparate projects on the same playing field uh, in this case, which is dollars. So I do wanna share uh, a few of these use cases that I mentioned and just share with you uh, some of the different scenarios in, in design and uh, policy development and other contexts when we think about how to develop capital programs or uh, change and, and alter um, different policies and programs from a, a municipal or, or government standard or support projects that fit under that guise. Uh, so the first one here um, is a, a recent and, and really interesting one with broad-based implications. I think many of you recognize that the shift in municipal leadership around climate change and adaptation mitigation. Um, one of our clients, uh, in this case, Miami-Dade County, working with uh, the NRDC as one of the 20 city energy program pilots around the U.S. and essentially 20 cities and counties 
to help implement um, you know, more sophisticated and impactful climate change and, and carbon reduction initiatives, in this case, focus on the largest, most polluting buildings uh, within the county. And, and so this is taking a look at buildings over um, 25,000 square feet. Um, and essentially, when you take up the, the massive portfolio of real estate within Miami-Dade County, it's something like nearly 11,000 buildings. And so if we Im implement a policy like this that looks at benchmarking, uh, auditing, and retuning from a, a building standpoint, it's an opportunity to, to drive, you know, let's say modest improvements in, in operations in these buildings that have, at the end of the day, massive implications from a carbon perspective. And so really what we did was look at, you know, what we're calling these three pillars, the benchmarking, retuning, and auditing, and taking a look at how performance could change because of these programs, look at the cost to develop these, and look at those implications, the change in operations, and what the costs and benefits were around that. So essentially, uh, when we conduct this business case and, and use our software auto case, uh, essentially build a long-term 40-year perspective towards the impacts. Roughly, if you can see my cursor, roughly $48 million in, in costs associated with those three pillars, those three programs, driving just from a utility standpoint over those 40 years, about $4.5 billion in net benefits. This is probably out of uh, all the projects I've been involved in, John mentioned about $100 billion in, in, in projects, um, the, the biggest ROI. Um, that we've seen really speaks to the, uh, the massive implications by focusing on only the largest uh, facilities in this case. And um, more so than just the financial perspective, valuing those emissions, the reduction in greenhouse gases and broader criteria air pollutants, we see another you know, $3.2 billion in, in public benefits that have been created. So really the, the county was put in a position um, to help uh, support this program with these analytics and it has used it extensively in, in their outreach to the market. Here's a, another proposed um, policy change and uh, ordinance in this case for work that we supported the city of San Francisco on. And this was uh, a large scale green roof or living roof ordinance um, that, that they passed and put in requirements for a few years ago. And this was essentially taking a, a large scale, uh, 230 acre, 17 city block area of a city, this, the Soma district, and looking at, well, what would the implications long-term be? Again, those trade-offs between the costs of these green roofs versus the, the broader public benefits that would be created through this ordinance and really built this, again, long-term study period over 25 years, took those future cash flows, discounting them to, to present value dollars, and then we get our, our metrics here, our, our denotation of value. And when we look at the, the costs associated with it, about, about $20 million in additional costs from additional operations and maintenance, additional costs for um, roof retrofits, so on and so forth. But we can see here these social and environmental implications here quite substantial and, and substantial enough to, to more than offset those additional costs and under uh, some of these you know, large impacts here in, in property value uh, enhancements from having this additional green roof and, and additional um, amenities associated with it. Substantial flood risk mitigation, recreational opportunities, carbon and air pollution sequestration, and in this case, the biggest impact, uh, water quality enhancements in, in the Bay Area from, from reducing significant stormwater runoff. So quite a, a, a story that the city was able to share with the development community and they were able to to get buy-in um, and public support for that ordinance. Uh, here's another um, stormwater related project. In this case, uh, we collaborate with um, Hunter Resilient Cities and, and the Rockefeller Foundation and received uh, direct grant support from Rockefeller Foundation to essentially start what was a um, 100 RC national green infrastructure challenge. So this was, let's say, a call to action for uh, all of the North American 100 RC cities um, to, to bring, bring us their interesting green stormwater infrastructure project, their flood risk mitigation projects. And then what we would do is um, build the business case for this and build in additional 
aspects into our software so that the other 100 RC cities could benefit from these analytics. And this was the winning project, a uh, what's called Mirabeau Water Garden, 25 acre former convent redeveloped into essentially a flood mitigation stormwater containment project with a host of public benefit, uh, benefits, different amenities associated with it. And really, um, you know, what we did, I'll just focus on the site for a second. So we've got these massive um, stormwater detention ponds here, but just a whole swath of recreation trails, parkland, um, ecosystem um, services and habitat for, for the region, um, significant amenities for the surrounding neighborhood, and also opportunities for schools uh, to provide educational opportunities around this sort of project. And when we built the business case, um, in this case, the, the biggest impact was flood risk mitigation. You know, it, it served its purpose, um, driving $90 million in net benefits, which far and exceed the additional costs associated with, with this project and the redevelopment. So just there, more than paying for it in uh, avoided property damage, direct and indirect, uh, over the life of this study, but also just such a, a broad variety of public benefits associated with this and really put the, the city of New Orleans in a position to garner additional funding and additional support for these sorts of programs, much larger scale within the broader, what's called Gentilly Resilience District in, in New Orleans. So overall proving roughly $79 million in, in net benefits. I just wanna move on to, to some of the um, buildings work that we support as well. And, and we've got quite a, a broad base uh, of aviation work, working with roughly a dozen of the largest airports in, in the U.S. right now. Um, SFO was one of them. Uh, we supported the uh, $2.5 billion Terminal 1 redevelopment across multiple standpoints. We supported the uh, utility master plan, and as well as sort of the design work that was split here in, in Terminal 1 and boarding Area B. And SFO requires the use of these analytics um, in how it develops its, its facilities. I think that the intent there is really to have this lens for those value trade-offs to ensure that the airport is driving value for its passengers, uh, for its staff, and is using its, um, its budget as wisely as it can. And, and so in this case, uh, working with boarding area B, working with a design team hand in hand, looking at hey, what are some designs that would drive um, employee and customer satisfaction, that would drive energy use intensity reduction, um, drive sustainability and resilience, but which ones drove value at the end of the day that was of, of great interest. And so we compared very disparate investments, green roof, uh, different glazing options, and, and were able to provide these outcomes so that the design team could make um, substantive decision to support the program. Um, another example here is uh, flood mitigation work. So, so triple bottom line cost benefit, um, I think has a, a very strong use in this context of better understanding the trade-offs from investments in resilience versus the, the costs and the long-term outcomes and implications. And, and we use these analytics in, in many different situations from forest fire risk reduction to, to sea level rise and hazard mitigation. And so in, in this particular case, City of Miami recently um, had put out a $400 million uh, resilience go bond essentially. And that was to uh, really invest in, in innovative infrastructure projects that um, combated sea level rise and, and flooding. And one of the projects that we looked at um, just generally to support the efforts of Miami Downtown Development Authority in the city was uh, investing in, in more substantial um, flooding protection along its seawall. So looking at uh, 44,000 linear feet, all of downtown Miami, and looking at changing the design and construction codes from a five-foot seawall to a seven-foot seawall. And then looking at a second option that had that higher seawall but also invested in mangroves and seagrass as this concept of, of a living shoreline and then looking at the implications that would come out of that and taking into account the massive real estate portfolio of downtown Miami, the sea level rise projections, 
um, you know, Army Corps of Engineer uh, data on depth damage functions and undertaking a, a rigorous GIS exercise, you know, what would the long-term impacts be to help prevent the, the damage? And, and here's some of the results here. You can see up here at the top, the different designs that we had in, in the two different options, the higher seawall and the seawall with the living shoreline as well. And looking at the, the results over a 40 year study period, we can see the, on the left hand side, uh, this was just the, the hardened infrastructure, the seven foot seawall on the right side at the bottom, including the living shoreline, both drove substantial net benefits, meaning that they drove greater value for money associated with them. So they were essentially driving um, substantial economic and um, community benefits here. Uh, the, the seven foot seawall on its own, $338 million in net benefits, almost half a billion dollars from the living seawall. And, and you know, more of those benefits really coming from this concept of ecosystem services, the um, improvements in water quality, the enhanced habitat for fish, the reduction in uh, wave attenuation that the mangroves provide and reduction in damage. So uh, not only substantial net benefits, but substantial jobs and economic impacts that, that came from this and helping the city of Miami to invest in, in resilience projects um, quite broadly. We've done other work supporting state of California and its high-speed rail project, looking at net zero energy and a variety of of different designs under different um, design guidelines and really helping them understand those trade-offs. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on that one just quickly. And the last example I have before passing it over to, to Shane Minkley to talk about that Tropicana redevelopment is work that we've done for, for the DOD. And we've had actually a substantial amount of, of work uh, around the world for, for the DOD, helping them invest um, in sustainability and resilience and health outcomes um, one example here is the $1.2 billion world-class, what they're calling evidence-based design healthcare facility in, in Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas, and supporting the, the design across you know, any number of considerations from energy, water conservation, and, and health outcome improvement. And I just want to kind of, without getting into the results too closely, speak to the kinds of projects that we looked at. So these different energy projects, co-generation, thermal storage, peak shaving, um, you know, very innovative things like uh, well, ground source heat pumps, but HVAC micro turbines, kind of really interesting um, ideas that they put out there and looking at those trade-offs and benefits, also comparing wastewater treatment and water reuse. Um, you know, different things to help secure its energy, its water use, and create a, a resilience facility. And one thing that we looked at was the reduction uh, or investments that can be made under the name of reduction hospital acquired infections. And you know, we have all this uh, on our mind right now, given the, the state of the world, and, and we thought it'd be a, a useful example here how we can use economics and, and science and marry the two, and in this case, looking at, well, what are the outcomes from investing in hydrogen, or hydrogen peroxide vapor cleaning, uh, where we can reduce infection incidences from immunocompromised and high-risk patients substantially. Um, hydrogen peroxide vapor cleaning, for example, patient gets treated, leaves the room, the door seals, pumps the room full of hydrogen peroxide vapor, kills everything in the room. So the, the effectiveness um, in reducing HAIs, hospital acquired infections, just an absolutely astronomic um, difference from you know the, the typical case of cleaning versus using these uh, advanced technologies. And out of all those you know several dozen investments that we looked at, these actually drove the biggest outcomes, the highest ROI, um, because they drove HAIs so far lower. So just wanted to, to share that one as well, and maybe Shane pass it over to you. I'm just gonna stop sharing, and uh, you can take it away for a quick recap here. You've got about 10 minutes. Okay, thanks, Eric. So um, we were fortunate, fortunate enough to be involved last year with uh, the Tropicana Field redevelopment down in St. Petersburg, Florida with our friends at BHB. Um, basically, there's been a dance between the baseball team and the city for a little while, and the baseball team looks like it's going to move on to other pastures. I don't know if they're greener. 
But um, essentially 85 acres of prime real estate in a very confined space has been opened up. And the city has really been considering um, more aggressive sustainability standards in order to push the developers who are going to build anything on the site to a, a higher level of overall benefits, which would include both, you know, as, as we've been speaking to the financial, but the social and environmental sides as well. So currently it's, it's a very gray dominated site with a large uh, parking lot section in order to feed the stadium. And there's been some kind of um, subterranean uh, creek that's been running underneath all of this gray infrastructure, hitting this low point you can see over here uh, at, this, at this, what would be a pond in the master plan, <clears throat> which is quite polluted at this point. So um, as part of the redevelopment, there's a big site component, which will green back or, or renovate the stream area, bring this uh, low point into a usable pond for recreation, uh, connect everything with walking paths and really open up the space in order for the, the community to see larger benefits. Uh, and as of January of 2019, actually, St. Petersburg is going to mandate all infrastructure projects to hit some sort of third party certification, including Envision. So if this is going to move forward, then they're going to have to uh, hit their credits. And a lot of the analysis that we did is really tied to those credits as well. <clears throat> so this is at a very early stage, as, as Eric was speaking to, a lot of times we're brought in at a very early stage. Um, and with this kind of master plan, we have high level takeoffs in terms of building typologies as well as general gross square footages to work with. So we took these four different building typologies, which were dominant across the building uh, designs. We took the site master plan and we really kind of married them together, looking at what the lead gold standard they're proposing would look like as well as this master plan site design, which will kind of replace that gray area. So um, this comparison looks at a 25 year time span of the base case kind of um, standard code building to a lead gold mandate through hitting the credits that you see here on the screen, uh, as well as that change to that, that more green space and using the beauty of cloud computing. Let me just pull up the right window here. We're able to do this in a, in a very quick and much more cost-effective fashion. So uh, we have here what would be kind of the facsimile for the um, standard code buildings across all those build building typologies and in those gross square footages. And we have that separated out amongst each of those building typologies and then the site with the total aggregated value you can see here, about $185 million over 25 years. Um, if you drill, I mean, these kinds of high level numbers are always good. I mean, any times you see, anytime you see a big positive number, you're going to be happy, but there's a lot more context to these things. So if you want to drill down and really see where that benefit is being driven from, you can see that the environmental and social values are actually much, much, uh, much, much bigger than uh, you would think across the different building typologies. Um, and that really contributes to this gigantic overall TBL value. Uh, but in terms of who's getting the benefit, in terms of what the policy is really going to manifest, and you can see that building occupants are really the ones who are going to be the beneficiaries of the policy changes with a large community component as well. So the policy really ends up being a big win for the community at large if it's going to be enacted. Um, and if you want to see exactly how that all shakes down, uh, you can drill back down and look into exactly what's driving the financial returns, which is largely going to be those energy efficiencies that's being invested in, but also significant savings across both the other utility aspects. Um, and then uh, the really interesting thing here is when you drill down into the site itself, you can see that 25 years is not really going to capture the reality of the value that the site is providing. Uh, and, it, and this kind of $10 million residual asset is the leftover value that is not being realized through this shorter time span that we're analyzing. So the aspects of the site, you know, the, the flood risk reductions, the water quality uplift, the urban heat island reductions, all of these things are going to perpetuate well beyond our study period. And that kind of aspect is, is reflected inside of the case study. So uh, these different site considerations really map very well to the ISI framework. And in providing those kinds of social and environmental benefits, the master plan aims to um, really bring the value to not only the financial savings for building owners or for the, the municipality, but also the big um, societal aspects that are going to affect us through time.
Um, and with that, I'll open up to any questions. Great, thank you both. I think we do have time for a couple of questions here and we've got some good ones coming in. Um, so you guys shared a lot of examples from a range of municipalities. Uh, you also had um, some examples from, uh, I believe the, the Department of Defense as well. Do you see, uh, are, and are you seeing any changes to policies at the, the um, either the municipal or state or even federal level uh, where we're turning to um, requiring or uh, policies around uh, requiring triple bottom line cost benefit analysis? Yeah, good, great question. So, you know, I think from a, um, a a, a government standpoint, um, you know, every <laughs> the, the challenge is such a, a, a wide variety of uh, municipal regulations and, and state, for example. So, you know, the DOD uh, does have life cycle cost requirements. I mentioned um, billions of dollars in, in federal funding that does require the use of cost benefit and, and the essentially the, the, the valuation of those benefits in, in the application for funding. Uh, so that's a, a, a pretty consistent uh, standpoint. I think on the municipal side, it, it's highly inconsistent. We are, um, you know, if we can think of airports as, um, as municipality um, related infrastructure, um, certainly leaders in the space like SFO Airport, um, like Atlanta Airport, um, you know, really requiring the use of, of TBL, CBA and, and how it approaches capital planning and, and development. Um, so, you know, I'd expect that as we move forward in a state of, of rapid investment and uh, investment with an eye for, for public benefits and, you know, before this crisis that we're facing right now, really um, a reinvigorated discussion more than I've ever seen around decarbonization and, and resilience and um, you know, climate change. So I think those things will, will all marry very well in, in how governments approach decision making in the future. Great, thank you. Shane, did you have any, any comments to, to that question to add? Um, just quickly, I think that there's um, some qualitative TBL uh, mandates that go through reporting, so they have to consider the social and environmental aspects, but a qualitative mandate just doesn't have the same bite as it does uh, if you have a quantitative mandate, and allowing for the really kind of um, scientific lens towards what the project impacts are is, I think, an important step towards getting better optimized project outcomes. Great, thank you. Well, thank you both for your presentations this morning. I think you've set the stage well for the remainder of this webinar. Um, and we can turn it over now to Anthony Kane. Um, Anthony, whenever you are ready, uh, please share with us what you have prepared for today. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, and thank you, Eric and Shane. Just get this set up. Great, and uh, thank you all for being here today. I'd like to start off by just echoing John's comments at the start of the session that we really are in a watershed moment for the planet. Uh, I think we all feel that. Probably one of the few cases in history where the entire population of the globe is experiencing uh, a universal uh, uh, experience. And so uh, I think it's really important that while obviously the most pressing thing right now is uh, minimizing the spread of the disease and minimizing loss of life, uh, we can think forward to the other side of this crisis, and, and I feel very strongly that we'll come out of this uh, knowing that sustainable and resilient infrastructure is even more critical now than ever. Um, and so I think uh, just something to, to factor in as we make our comments today and tomorrow. Another one uh, to uh, go back to uh, Jones, his office's comments, I think in times of anxiety, it's also important to find some things to hope for. And so I just jotted down a few things that I'm hopeful for about in this time of crisis. One, um, while I'm super appreciative and I think we've had our attention drawn to the critical role of not only healthcare providers, but food supply providers in our, uh, in our culture, in our, in our lives, uh, we all know that from the infrastructure industry, there's a lot of unsung heroes right now who aren't working from home, uh, who are, uh, have to be at their jobs because they're providing the water, the energy, the telecommunication systems uh, that are allowing us uh, to, to have this conference today. 
So that's one thing I'm hopeful for about. Another one is the stories of environmental rebound that I'm sure we're all hearing as well. Uh, dolphins and swans in Venice, different parts of the globe, uh, when human activity has uh, decreased, the environment is rebounding. And I think that's something to be hopeful for about. And that leads me to another thing to be hopeful for about is that I think uh, as we all are working from home, are changing our behaviors and our consumption patterns, uh, that uh, when we come out of this, it might lead to a reflection on how we live our lives and, and what is important in our lives. Uh, and I think that will also lead to a global conscious around uh, the interconnections of our globe and our society, which for those of us working in sustainability, the interconnections are fundamental to everything that we do. Uh, and I think we'll see uh, an appreciation of that going forward. So just very quickly, I wanted to say those things, a few notes of hope. And as John mentioned, I think an important role for all of us in making sure that the future is guided towards uh, sustainability and resilience. I'm not sure why there are these red lines on the screen. Uh, let me see if I can perhaps clear those out. Uh, can you click your, down in the bottom left, uh, there's a little pencil mark. Will that clear them for you? Let me see. What about the little guy next to it? I'm just going to try to end the show real quickly and restart. Hopefully that will. Okay, well, so I'll keep moving in the interest of time and I apologize if uh, there's a distraction. Um, there you go. Oh, great. Oh. Oh. <laughs> anyway, so very quickly for those of you who are attending uh, the seminars and who aren't familiar with ISI and Envision, uh, ISI was created by the American Society of Civil Engineers, the American Public Works Association and the American Council of Engineering Companies. Uh, and then we partnered with the Zofnis Program for Sustainable Infrastructure at the Graduate School of Design uh, at Harvard University to create Envision. And, and that's very exciting. I think maybe, uh, you know, another uh, ray of hope is I've been attending these Harvard Zofnis workshops for over 10 years now. And uh, due to the limitations of the space at Harvard University, usually attendance is around uh, 80 people or so, I would guess, um, just because of the size of the rooms. But I'm noticing that on today's call, we have over 260 attendees. So I think it's a wonderful, um, again, silver lining in, in, in all of this that we're finding ways to share information and share these, these experiences with an even larger audience. Uh, and so we created Envision, and this, Envision is essentially just a framework for understanding uh, the complex nature of sustainability and sustainable infrastructure. It's broken up into 64 indicators across these uh, different categories to help people understand and to guide their decision making when developing sustainable infrastructure. And so this is a chart which is made much worse by the lines that I can't seem to uh, get rid of. Uh, but I think this is critical when we're looking at the economic analysis, which is the theme of our session today, that uh, it's it also changes over time. So uh, as we all know, we know this chart from a lot of project management scenarios, but our ability to make changes versus the cost to make those changes over time. And I think that the perception that sustainability costs more is often a factor that we are still largely designing conventional infrastructure projects. Uh, and then later in the process, deciding to add on sustainability features or trying to calculate the cost of sustainability features that get added into a conventional project rather than starting at the very beginning of this process and looking at uh, how do we fundamentally change our approach to infrastructure in order to make it more sustainable and that's much more of a challenge and can also make the economic analysis much more challenging because we're just fundamentally again changing the way that we do things i think the more that we push uh, the introduction of sustainability earlier in the process, the more this perception of higher costs associated with sustainability will go away, and, and the more we will see benefits. Now, one of the uh, things we have to keep in mind is as we do this, as we start implementing sustainability earlier and earlier, 
it requires us knowing where we're going uh, and how we're going to get there. And that's where I think systems like Envision are helpful because they provide that framework. They provide a way of thinking ahead and, and going through the different indicators to determine at this very early planning stage, how are we going to address sustainability during design and construction? Uh, so that's just an important factor, uh, I think, when we're doing these economic uh, cases. So very quickly, some more reasons to hope. Uh, we have seen here an increase in our Envision sustainability professionals year over year. So I think there's a growing awareness and appreciation within the profession that sustainability is critical to what we do. We're also seeing this growing appreciation for project verifications and proving uh, the sustainability of our projects now with $22.3 billion of rated projects. So this to me is a signal that infrastructure owners are also uh, growing in their appreciation for sustainability. And also uh, this kind of uh, mirrors Eric's uh, diagram, but we're seeing that sustainability has broad geographic distribution. This is just throughout the US and Canada. We also see this in other countries. Uh, it's not just a East Coast, West Coast concern. Uh, as you can see uh, throughout the country, sustainability is a growing priority. And here, again, while there's broad geographic distribution, I'm just gonna highlight today a quick example from California where we do see, not surprisingly, a, a very high interest in sustainable infrastructure. And I'm just going to walk through briefly. Uh, now, compared to uh, Eric and Shane's wonderful presentation, this is gonna be the, the amateur's version of uh, economic analysis uh, in, a, in a very quick kind of back uh, of napkin approach, uh, but I hope it might be useful to you. I wanna highlight a case study that was produced by, again, Harvard University's softness program. This is for the Sun Valley Watershed Multi-Benefit Project in Los Angeles. It was one of the earliest projects to get Envision verified. Uh, it has also gone through this economic analysis through the Harvard University researchers, and it's just been a great example. So to set the scene very quickly, I'm going to try to summarize a very complex project in about five minutes, so bear with me. Uh, but we all know that Los Angeles, uh, key factors there, very dry climate most of the time, uh, issues with groundwater uh, and water supply, but at the same time, very intense storm systems and issues with flooding and that flooding then also causing water quality issues. So here we see the Sun Valley uh, area and some of the really um, important impacts that they were experiencing with flooding. And of course, then how are we going to address this? And there was of course a conventional approach. Uh, easiest way would be to just improve the stormwater management system, uh, take this water away, uh, but that wouldn't really help any of the other issues that this region is facing. So they took an approach uh, of, of a combination of uh, best management practices, low impact development, uh, about a dozen or so smaller scale projects, all looking at not only stormwater management, but groundwater infiltration, uh, improvement of public spaces, improvement of city beautification, water quality. And so you can see here some just side by side examples up at the top, uh, a neighborhood dramatically improved by bioswales and, and beautification. Here at the bottom, and I apologize for the quality of one of the images here, uh, a park that was remade with a groundwater infiltration system and a new park on top. And similarly, a side-by-side -side of, a, of a flooded alley here in that same alley, now made into a beautiful amenity and a bioswale. So really, um, Innovative, uh, I would say innovative in the approach, but I think we've all seen these examples before, but really deployed at scale to have serious impacts on water quality. And then just again, running through very quick math here. This is the, the again, the amateur version of, uh, of the economic analysis, but we were looking at a situation where the traditional stormwater solution that probably would have gone into effect had a $73 million cost with a $78 million benefit in, in uh, reduced flooding. And so we'd say, oh, that looks, that looks pretty good. Uh, and then if we would have proposed a sustainable solution as we saw with uh, you know, new parks, bioswales, street, re uh, street rebuilds, 
the sustainable solution would be $172 million. And I think this is often where the conversation stops. So we see traditional $73 million, sustainable $172 million. End of story. But what's underneath some of these numbers? So when you really look at it though, there were the $78 million in flood control benefits, but then there were also $88 million in water quality benefits from these solutions, and another $78 million in water supply benefits from the groundwater infiltration. So a total of $244 million in benefits compared to the $172 million in costs. Now, some of you may stop here when you're looking at these analysis, and I would point out that the Harvard case study they focused on these three, flood control, water quality, and water supply, as just being the easiest to directly quantify in terms of costs and benefits. Uh, as you heard in Eric's presentation, there were numerous other benefits to these projects. You could think of, again, the uh, property value of these neighborhoods that were improved, the benefit to the community of having more public parks and spaces for the habitat restoration. But, the Harvard case study really just focused on hard quantifiable numbers on this one. So again, now we're seeing $244 million in benefits to $172 million in costs versus $78 million in benefits to $73 million in costs. It really changes the story, but it doesn't stop just there because then when you look at the multi-benefits, the flood control agency, if you were to break these costs by the different agencies that were directly receiving benefits, they would have been looking at a $55 million contribution for $78 million in benefits. The Water Supply Agency, again, a $55 million investment to $78 million in benefits. And the Water Quality Agency, $62 million in investment for $88 million. Oh, sorry, there's a typo there, in benefits. So now let's go back and look at that, just the Flood Control Agency, a traditional stormwater solution, $73 million in costs, for $78 million in benefits, but by layering the benefits and getting more agencies involved in addressing more issues in the region, now that flood control agency is looking at a $55 million investment for $78 million in benefits. So you could see a direct savings there for them in this approach. And again, this is a very uh, oversimplified uh, way of looking at it, but I just wanna give this as a model of how we can begin to think differently about the economic evaluation around sustainability and this second bullet point that we often stop at is not the full story. Uh, and if we stop there, we miss this important factor of, well, maybe it could be a $55 million project instead of a $73 million project. Um, so just one thing uh, to think about as we move forward, uh, I would also say there was an important point in the case study where they interviewed the assistant deputy director of the Public, Parks, uh, Public Works Department and they mentioned you know, this perception that the natural systems would have a higher maintenance cost. And the response to that was, uh, they don't have a higher maintenance cost, they just have a different maintenance cost. And that's often a challenge uh, when we're looking at doing sustainable projects because we're doing them in a different way. That's the nature of, of us, of the sustainable project is we have to do things differently. Uh, and there's costs associated with that and there's uncertainties associated with that, but that shouldn't be a deterrent uh, when we're looking at the true value. So just three quick takeaways uh, to my first diagram, are we early enough in the process to make good economic decisions? And are our economic evaluations being colored by the fact that we, we didn't make good decisions early enough in the process? Secondly, uh, just as the example from Sun Valley, did we calculate the full multi-benefit value of sustainable infrastructure? and break out of our traditional silos? Uh, did we walk through that whole logical step and not just stop when we saw that the sustainable project would be more expensive? Uh, and then as I just mentioned, did we adjust for first costs or the need to change our structures and systems? So if we're doing something differently, uh, we may have a tendency to overestimate costs or we'll have to include the costs of changing the way we're doing something, but that shouldn't be a deterrent when creating an economic argument for our projects because once we get past those first costs, we may be seeing significant savings over time. Um, so I know that was a very quick presentation. Again, I hope I left you all with at least a few uh, items of, of hope at this time and I really appreciate you all taking the time to join us today and I think uh, we'll be able to open it up for questions. Uh, and again, sorry for the, the red lines that magically appeared. 
Great, thank you, Anthony. I think those red lines are just an added interactive feature for the live <laughs> event today. Thank you, Lindsay. Everybody on their toes. Um, I appreciated your presentation. I especially liked that you were able to show us, you know, here's, here's what the traditional financial story is. You have the costs and you have the benefits. I think that traditional story um, resonates well with everybody on the call. And then you showed us, you know, how in the Sun Valley multi-benefit project, they were able to go deeper in that and then that and to show kind of what's the full range of costs, what's the full range extending beyond that and what are the benefits. Um, so kind of carrying on the theme of, of telling the full story, can you kind of bring it back to Envision for our viewers today? Can you talk a little bit about how Envision helps uh, project teams communicate this this full story of their of the benefits of their project. Absolutely, and I think um, probably what I would focus on is what we see with Envision in that diagram of changing the way we approach projects by thinking about sustainability early on. What we find most often is that process of thinking through uh, different impacts, different benefits that a project may have is itself one. Uh, a source of innovation, uh, a source of creativity in projects about thinking things, thinking of things in a different way, and then also just good project management. Uh, because again, we're getting more people involved, we're thinking through solutions, we're thinking through new opportunities, we're layering benefits on top of each other. So that's where I see the role of Envision, is we're the catalyst for this type of thinking and this process that then can produce the economic value and the economic benefits that you'll see. Uh, and for example, doing a more detailed economic analysis that you can then prove. Uh, and so you need that process and you need that catalyst to, to get to that solution. And that's where I think the real value is. Great, I think that's fantastic. And thank you for those additional details. I think we, at this time, we can turn it over to uh, Carrie, who will provide some more details and examples for us. Carrie, whenever you are ready, please share your screen and get started. Great, thank you. And thank you, um, John and Anthony and uh, Eric and Shane. I'm probably gonna echo quite a few things here um, that have been said. Um, let me pull up the presentation. Give me one second to make this work properly. And we're just gonna switch this. There we go. So um, again, thanks everybody for joining this morning. Um, my name is Carrie Hewitt and I am Director of Client Services with KLA. I recognize a lot of names um, and some faces even popping up on video um, from uh, my previous work. Uh, some of you know me from my work at BHB as Director of Sustainability there prior to moving over to uh, partner firm KLA. And um, I'm going to share uh, more from a planning a planner's perspective today. Um, so I I'm going to be even even more amateur about the economics than than Anthony. Um, I am going to speak from a non-engineer, non-economist non uh, perspective and just share how we kind of layer this type of thinking and analysis into our overall sustainability and resiliency planning work. Um, but first, I did want to just echo um, Anthony's and um, John's comments on uh, the source of hope that they're feeling here. I am uh, definitely in awe of the number of folks who have convened today. Um, I love the sense of community that is building around moving forward on sustainability. So um, thank you all. And I hope this is just the beginning of the conversation. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, Planner's perspective here. So I have done a, a great deal of uh, sustainability and resiliency planning for municipalities, airports, uh, transit agencies. Uh, that's that's kind of my background and where I where I come from in this perspective. And over that time and that experience, we've seen increasingly significant bold commitments around this. Um, and I know that attention may be elsewhere at this exact moment, but um, if anything, I think we will uh, feel reinvigorated to, to focus our efforts, um, particularly around health and sustainability and resiliency moving forward. Um, so we see these get uh, these large aggressive goals get adopted. Um, we even develop really detailed action plans around this. Sometimes they're embedded in these large comprehensive or master plans. Um, but 
you know, as Anthony alluded to before, sometimes the conversation gets stuck. Um, so how do we actualize and implement these um, strategies? How do we achieve these goals um, as we're trying to move from just the planning phase uh, into ongoing management? And um, I'm a big fan of the sort of plan, do, check, act uh, approach that I'm sure a lot of folks on this call are familiar with. Um, but really, uh, I think we want to embed sustainability and resiliency into our ongoing decision making. Um, and that creates a, a system of continuous improvement and really gets us from a place of planning to a place of true sustainable management. And the only way that we're going to get there is being able to demonstrate that value um, that's been talked about a lot already today and particularly that we're using our dollars wisely and that's going to be incredibly important as uh, John mentioned at the beginning uh, as we see this sort of uh, reinvestment in our infrastructure and in our capital improvement projects uh, we need to be transparent and thoughtful about how we're investing those dollars and so that's where i believe that tools like triple bottom line cost benefit analysis as well as um, frameworks like envision and similar tools uh, really help with that transparency piece and to create that um, value proposition argument that is so crucial to these uh, conversations one of the challenges we see in that, however, is, um, and I think this has been alluded to throughout the day so far, but um, capital investment in sustainable and resilient solutions that exists within a capital budget, perhaps a capital improvement department or um, team of folks. And a lot of the times in the traditional financial uh, analysis, the risk reductions or the savings that we might achieve through some of those investments happen within an operations budget or are seen through another department or another agency even. And so marrying these two um, kind of siloed financial components is a really critical part of getting to more sustainable and resilient management. And I think that the role of triple bottom line cost benefit analysis or sustainable return on investment analyses is really part of creating more of that dialogue and that conversation. So I, in my experience, um, and, and again, I've, I've worked on projects from the earliest conceptual uh, phases and the sort of high level visioning, master planning, goal setting stage, um, all the way through kind of trying to carry out design and, and um, uh, assessing alternatives for projects. And I think that there's a number of different places in our sustainability planning and management processes where we can insert um, this type of triple bottom line uh, financial assessment. And so we can do that through evaluation and prioritization of strategies or particular projects. So that might be, um, and I'll give a couple examples of this later, but uh, you're going through a planning process and you uh, have a laundry list of strategies that might be put forward in a plan and you're trying to whittle that down. You're trying to get that um, into a prioritized list. This type of value-based um, triple bottom line assessment can help in that prioritization process, uh, particularly if you're trying to make a case for um, with management or leadership who really speak in those financial terms, being able to apply that monetary um, lens to some of these uh, previously considered more less tangible um, sustainability benefits. We can also do it through assessing design alternatives for projects. Um, and so this can come into play when you're doing an alternatives assessment on a, on a particular project design and um, looking at if we tweaked these various components, what does that do to our TBL and how does that actually get us to a better project in the end? Um, also, and I think you know this this came up a little bit in what Anthony was saying, but um, thinking about um, the timing of of when we do these types of analyses. So um, I do agree that earlier is better, um, but I I've, I've also seen this as an effective tool for tracking results and assessing a realized value. So um, understanding where we can um, 
when we are implementing and, and actually making those capital investments, uh, what is the actual value that we're seeing over the long term? And some of these can't be tracked, you know, they're years out, um, but where can we um, start to assess these, track the actual value um, through this kind of monetized assessment and really demonstrate a case for continued investment moving forward, uh, which gets to my last point. And so um, for me personally, again, being an amateur economist or not really an economist at all, um, tools like AutoCase um, and, and others that do this sort of sustainable return on investment analysis are really critical um, for, for me to be able to, as a planner, um, bring this layer of analysis and making that case so that we can get beyond that conversation of doesn't it cost more? Um, because those of us who are doing sustainability plans and trying to push sustainability within organizations know that that's the question that you always get is, um, isn't this going to just cost us more? And so these kinds of tools and analyses that can monetize all of those additional benefits um, in addition to the strictly financial around social and environmental uh, and health benefits, um, you know, the value of clean air, clean water, the social cost of carbon. I know uh, Eric went through a lot of these resiliency benefits, flood mitigation, risk reduction, those types of things, being able to articulate those uh, within a, a monetary value framework uh, really helps to move that conversation along. <clears throat> so just a, f a couple of examples, and, and some of these are from my, um, my previous work and, and some from my current position. Um, so with Nashville International Airport, um, this is an interesting one because this was a, um, a triple bottom line uh, cost benefit analysis that I believe Eric was involved with, um, looking at a geothermal uh, project that they were, that they actually had already moved forward on. Um, and this was um, really interesting. The analysis was done and, and showed the, um, all of the social and environmental benefits from this particular geothermal project. Um, and it was actually utilized after the fact um, to help articulate more of the case for additional investment. So looking at um, trying to make uh, a, a case to their senior management of, hey, these are the types of benefits we're gonna see from this project and also to help communicate it more broadly to their various stakeholders um, uh, of why this, this project was happening, what it was gonna bring to the airport and to the community as a whole. So um, that's a, an interesting, you know, kind of flip side of this is that it can be used for kind of decision-making purposes, but it can also be used as a really important communication tool for, um, again, making that, uh, that values case and helping people understand why are we investing all of these dollars in this particular project? What are we going to see as the outcomes of that? Um, St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg was already mentioned earlier today. Um, and, and Shane, thank you for that overview of the, the TROPS site. Um, so I, uh, again, in my previous work at VHB was working on the St. Petersburg, Florida uh, Integrated Sustainability Action Plan. And um, as, as Shane mentioned, they are taking a really aggressive stance on uh, sustainability and resiliency, um, adopting Envision as policy for their projects, as well as really taking a look at this um, so, uh, excuse me, sustainable return on investment approach. Um, so as we were um, finalizing the, the ISAP um, and looking at some various strategies that were to be implemented, um, we did bring in um, AutoCase folks to do some assessments on um, various pavement alternatives was just one example. Um, as you heard from Shane, they also took this to a full site development evaluation uh, to look at um, the various uh, costs and benefits from a sustainability perspective. And, um, and they're taking this very seriously in terms of how they're making decisions about projects moving forward and how they're, um, and they're trying to uh, embed this into their um, budgeting process. And that's a, a big shift and, and something that uh, I'll commend this city for um, in their, their efforts to really try to embed this into their decision making. Um, so finally, um, and I, I'm sure the folks on the, there are specific questions about this, the, the folks from um, Impact Infrastructure can speak in more detail, um, but uh, the city of San Antonio also through their 
uh, sustainability planning efforts looked at a, a couple different uh, areas, but in particular sort of looking at their tree canopy as well as their urban agriculture um, pilot program to look at, again, stormwater management, heat island reduction, um, as well as um, carbon sequestration benefits. So all of these uh, local food benefits and reduction of vehicle miles traveled, all of these different um, benefits from this uh, project that would come from a social and environmental uh, perspective. And that was to help, again, communicate and articulate all of the benefits of uh, investing in this particular pilot program. Um, and that, that made its way into their final sustainability and resiliency plan product. <clears throat> um, so, you know, with that, I just want to reemphasize um, that I think that there are examples where um, this type of analysis can be inserted in uh, the earliest planning stages, again, to help decide where do we move forward. Um, it can also be utilized as a, a place for sustainable decision making between project alternatives. And then also, I think, as a really important communication tool. And I talk about this with Envision as a whole, but I think particularly with this um, financial uh, sustainable return on investment analysis, being able to think about this um, as a communications tool as well um, and a justification tool when we're trying to emphasize as infrastructure owners uh, smart use of taxpayer dollars and as consultants um, I'm sure many of us on the phone are also consultants um, justifying those those costs and investments uh, to our clients as well um, and I think that um, we uh, we saw Anthony's I love Anthony's uh, curve about the ability um, and the cost to make changes and the timing of that and I think the earlier is always better and then I think revisiting these analyses over time will just further our case um, moving forward. So I think I'm going to leave it at that for now, um, allow for a couple minutes for questions and then I know we have a longer Q&A at the end. <clears throat> Great. Um, thank you so much Carrie for that. We do have a minute for, for questions. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, ask you a question um, and then we've got one coming through. Um, uh, through the chat pane as well, you kind of pinged on this. You said, um, you know, you can use this information, use these types of analyses to help you answer the the, the doesn't this cost more uh, question that we do get time and again. What's kind of your elevator pitch response to that? Um, you know, oftentimes when we get that question, we don't have time to pull out our full spreadsheets and show the software and our full, you know, detailed plan of this doesn't actually cost more. So wh what's the response to that question that you can uh, share with us? Yeah, I mean, the I try to be honest. Uh, so sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the answer is yes, it does cost more upfront. Um, and sometimes the conversation does stop there, as as Anthony was alluding to. And unfortunately, um, we're all working within confined budgets. Um, and confined, uh, from a consultant perspective, confined scope of work. So sometimes you don't always have the ability to bring that additional conversation. But I think um, what I kind of fall back to is, is first of all, that doesn't, doesn't always cost more. And as we've uh, developed more and more best practices and improved our, our technology and our, um, our, our various uh, processes for implementing this stuff, there are things that don't cost more. Um, so there, you know, it kind of depends on where they're coming from in the conversation. Um, but I think uh, creating a dialogue that includes examples of such projects. So one of the things I'm excited about is seeing this kind of library of case studies and examples that, um, the, these auto case folks, as, as well as others who have done this type of analysis, are able to bring to the table because um, it's starting a conversation and it's starting a dialogue around, um, hey, we need to break down our silos in terms of um, the upfront costs and the ongoing um, uh, savings that we and, and, and cost reductions that we'll see over time. So I really liked Anthony's point about um, this kind of sharing of costs that we can de demonstrate because um, I think we're increasingly heading into that frame where um, you know municipal municipalities, airports, various public agencies have very limited budgets. But when you're looking at the the savings that might be achieved 
uh, particularly from a social and environmental perspective, those are shared savings, shared savings from a community standpoint and across these agencies. So let's bring that argument to the table too, right? If we're able to articulate those benefits and across various departments, um, across various jurisdictions or agencies, um, that gives me hope, if you will, that we can um, be making these smarter decisions that have a much better long-term uh, return for everybody. Great, fantastic, thank you. And I think as um, as John Williams mentioned at the beginning, we will be able to hang on the line for more questions um, at the end of all, at the conclusion of all of our presentations. So let's uh, uh, thank you, Carrie, um, and we'll thank Carrie, and we will um, invite Jim Grant to uh, share your screen and share your presentation with us. Hey, hello, everybody. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so I'm the Energy and Fueling Systems Director at HNTB. I do a lot of utility master plans at airports across the United States. And the common theme between master plans and airports is that the, um, the dollar amounts of these projects can exceed a billion dollars and that our clients you know, have limited funding and have to make choices, tough economic choices, and it's over a period of time those choices are made, right? Every fiscal year, there's the discussion of how much goes where. <clears throat> the types of utilities we look at in utility master plans include uh, what's up on the screen and more at San Francisco, which is the MUIS, that's the Master Utilities Infrastructure Study that we're doing, involved all these, these 10 of these. Uh, you have the SFPUC that <clears throat> basically serves three of them. And um, we're also getting involved with uh, heating and cooling in the uh, central, uh, you know, heating and cooling chilled water plant as well. They have a, many of you maybe have heard the, the um, city ordinance that's coming out from San Fr city of San Francisco on uh, natural gas, for instance, uh, wanting to reduce natural gas and move more into electrical. San Francisco Airport has the benefit of 100% uh, sustainable power coming from the Hetch Hetchy Dam. So that's not a huge concern there, but it is a big demand hit uh, to the overall electrical service to the airport. So the process of every utility master plan involves eight steps that, that I like to use, uh, data collection, followed by a condition assessment of those utilities, whether that be interviews or detailed analysis, followed by demand analysis. Uh, typically we do these at airports that have big growth programs and <clears throat> there's a, it starts to tax the utility systems. And so we wanna know not only what the additional capacity needs are, but when they're gonna happen, what are the trigger points, what building infrastructure triggers the the, basically the limits on the capacity of the utilities. Moving into deficiency ranking, uh, where the immediate needs are, what's the most important. And then alternatives analysis has to do with, now that we know the deficiencies, let's come up with the alternatives to solve those deficiencies. And then the financial analysis, which is where we brought in impact infrastructure at, LAX and San Francisco and continue to do so at, at other airports, SeaTac. And then you make a decision on the preferred alternative. This is a, a colored map of San Francisco airport. This is uh, what we use to identify what buildings we can, uh, this, this utility master plan can impact. And in this case, the pink buildings our buildings that will be are scheduled beyond 2021. The blue buildings are buildings that are happening now are in the process. And so our master plan won't quite help them as much, but we want to pick them up at the end, nevertheless. And then the yellow shading is the where the non-vertical components are, taxiways, runways. And the reason we're homing in on vertical buildings is because they have oftentimes have the biggest impact on the utilities. 
So the two examples I'll be talking about are up here in zone 12, up in the north field area. So here's a zoom in on the north field area and the advanced water treatment plant is my example one, building S22, which you can see right in here in light blue, shown as a new building that's coming. And this is a building that'll take the, the primary treated water, secondary treated water, and, and, and move it to tertiary or advanced treatment. Now this is <clears throat> hard to see, but here we are in the north part of the airport, follow the green routing. And this is the routing of the recycled water distribution line. And there were several different alternative routes that we looked at, and this is the one we, we selected. And so it comes into the, and feeds the majority of the potable water that's displaced is based on restroom water. But there are some other uses such back here at the, at the Conrack facility for car washing and, and such. So this route was strategic to pick the majority of the demands along the way. Now in step seven of the process, the financial results, we see the recycled water capacity alternatives. Well, well, do nothing means no recycled water at all. And in contrast to that, we have the three alternatives, various sizes of tanks and quantities of tanks, vary the capital costs, and also the net present value costs. But the social and environmental net present value is where we displace the water and we get the savings. Pretty similar, but by doing nothing, we would, we would lose those savings. So the total triple bottom line, of course you see those numbers, and we come into the social and environmental benefits, and then the costs, and then the uh, benefit cost ratio. So in this case, the cheapest first cost wins out because the other benefits seem to be similar, but it's the, uh, it's the main fact that displacing potable water with recycled water is, is a no-brainer in this situation. So on that same example, a little bit more in the detail here, we, the net present value around 100 million over 50 years, this is, um, this is uh, <clears throat> why the TBL NPV is important. Over the do-nothing scenario, you get a net present value over 100 million. You avoid potable water use, uh, you know, which generates 168 million over 50 year period. That's 500,000 gallons a day. And that was a medium estimate there versus we did low, medium and high. And then the social environmental impact of 1.3 million, 5 million. So alternative one was selected in this case, it had the lowest capital cost highest NPV, and then that good financial cost ratio. This is one really helpful tool to guide the client to use, using economics and using the triple bottom line, and <clears throat> as well as the um, financial cost ratio to make the case. Now the uh, second example, is uh, the wastewater treatment plant, which is the Meliang treatment plant. It's S21, it's over here. Um, one of the problems there is that roughly 250,000 gallons of sewage um, during the peak discharge times, mostly from the terminal areas, um, there wasn't enough capacity or isn't enough capacity in the current MLTP plant. And so that results in, could be a discharge to the bay, which no one wants. Uh, you could bring in portable equipment to help on just those peak times, or you can add and expand to the plant. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> or you can expand uh, the plant itself. So in this scenario, you have uh, the SBR and AGB. So the SBR is the sequencing batch reactor and AGB aerobic granular biomass tank. Two different technologies, two different prices. And you can see the financial net present value that comes out. But the social environmental net present value benefits are, are big. 
and then you add those two to get the uh, triple bottom line. And then the social and environmental benefits are big as well. And divide those two out and you don't get over one in this case. So this is an interesting example in the fact that for every dollar we spent, we're getting 49 cents back or 46 cents back. And, but what are the alternatives? I mean, we certainly do not want to discharge to the bay. Uh, portable equipment is expensive, right? And going back and forth. Uh, it's, it's the cost of doing business. We still need to go through this economic analysis to understand what is the best, most sustainable approach going forward. So both alternatives, you know, offer the negative TBL NPV over the do nothing. We have uh, these main cost drivers. It's expensive proposition, expanding a wastewater treatment plant. You have the capex of 30 million and then the high electricity costs, right? When you're pumping, intensive pumping in these wastewater treatment plants. But the, you do have these benefits. The 1.7 million for the 250,000 gallon discharge. That's the cost avoidance of one of the two here, avoiding, avoiding city fines and or, um, you know, the portable equipment, avoiding that. So in this case, number two was selected, even though it had the higher capex, it brought some additional benefits. Additional benefits in, it's a smaller tank required for this process. So you can you could get a two for one, if you will. And then in addition, it treats uh, you know, the additional pollutants other than what the SBR can do. And so when the NPDS, permits come out in the future, it, San Francisco's thinking that the treating the value, the additional value, treating those additional pollutants will, will be a big benefit. Plus they don't have a limited footprint here. So the two tanks fitting in one space really makes a lot of sense. One thing I wanted to show you here was the great work that impact infrastructure provided. For each one of the projects, there's a summary list here, and I'm not gonna <laughs> go through all the, the details here, but I'm providing a methodology, explaining through all the net present value, social, environmental, triple bottom line, the nice comprehensive table, the utility itself, deficiency, the alternatives, capital, financial, social, triple bottom line. And then for each individual project, we'll just take, take the sanitary sewer project. There's a customized table, which lists out in more detail what the, each individual, uh, you know, the financial components, the social and environmental components. And then, you know, the combinations down here to get to the ratios. And then followed by bar charts and S curves. Really nice work. And <clears throat> I continue to use impact infrastructure. I think uh, it's, a, it's a huge benefit to what we do in utility master plan and work at airports. and. Um, I um, applaud them for those services because they're, they're sorely needed in, in this economic time that we're in. <laughs> and with that, Lindsay, I'm, I know I'm a little early, but um, that's really what I wanted to convey. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much, Jim. And we do have, uh, we do have some time here for questions, folks. Uh, so if you'd like to um, chime them in, Otherwise, we will we'll be staying on the, the call um, shortly after noon for more questions. Jim, I did want to ask you, I think our viewers really um, appreciated some of the examples you gave, especially the examples where you showed that um, uh, CBR, your uh, cost-benefit ratio, doesn't, um, even including your triple bottom line uh, cost-benefit analysis, doesn't result in a, a value over one. So we are beginning to see kind of um, that's just contributing to the the full story, right? Of you know of why we conduct these analyses. 
um, and here are some different examples on, on and some different results that you might get. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about um, how you are able to, um, how you're able to derive the social and the environmental uh, impacts to the to that triple bottom line how are we ensuring that they are not being overvalued or undervalued right and i'd almost want to bring eric in to help respond to this question but um you know it's a very good question and typically you hear the monte carlo term tossed mm -hmm. out and we look for the average and then we look for highs and lows uh, in everything we do because we just don't know what the future has in store for us. And so in this case, it was the same. If I go back to this case of the sewer plant here, if we look at um, you know, some of the discussions in here, we talk about uh, significant social here. So we look at discharge of 250,000 gallons of effluent, uh, different costs, high, low, types of numbers. Uh, the same thing is true with the first example on the reclaimed water. Uh, we had 500,000 gallons of savings up to 700,000 gallons and down to you know, 350,000. And so we do that type of uh, high, medium, and low scenarios so that the client can see, uh, you know, what if, right? Sensitivity type of rate, you know, information. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Jim, this is Eric. Um, just to to add to it, the the concept here of this uh, multidiscipline team, right? So you've got Jim as a technical expert doing this work for for decades, and uh, at at so many airports around the nation as well. And so being able to tap into that expertise and combine, you know, our expertise in in economics and um, and Jim and and his team's expertise in um, in engineering. And be able to come up with these different scenarios and these range of, of different outcomes to build in uncertainty and, and risk analysis and and really marrying those two and this is the the typical approach in in project delivery and analysis is you know, taking advantage of of interdisciplinary expertise leveraging it and building uh, those objective business cases Great. Back to memories. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Eric, for those um, additional details. I think we'll use this as a good segue now for our last presentation up. Um, Eric, I will get our screen, my screen shared here if you wanted to get us started. Yeah, sounds good. Well, hi again, everyone. Nice to be back. Uh, thank you very much for um, some of the, the insights as well um, from Carrie and Jim and, and Anthony, um, you know, I think where we sort of want to take this now is to, to talk about some of the, the broader um, use cases of, of these analytics. So we, we mentioned a number of examples and how to support design, capital planning, project prioritization, stakeholder outreach. Uh, um, more recently, there's been, let's say, new use cases, new way to, to augment um, the, the need for economics. And this is to help earn points uh, towards Envision ratings as well as towards the, the lead ratings. And you know, we've done um, sort of other you know, training, continuing education units with AIA, with American Society of, of Civil Engineers. And I, I think you know, more broadly, um, there is interest and in, you know, quite frankly, a need for you know, the technical experts and engineers and architects and, and folks that are helping to deliver um, in, incredible innovative projects to, to the public, um, that they understand how to build a business case and make the case for their great designs and great projects as well. And so really uh, this session, we wanna focus on, on how these analytics can support uh, both of those frameworks and envision and, and lead. And on the lead side, I'll be speaking a, a little bit later uh, we can earn uh, two innovation credits. So uh, basically by conducting an analysis, uh, not only do you get those insights, but you also get points as well. And within um, Envision V3, there's a new 
dedicated credit category in, in leadership and development, LD 3.3, uh, where you can earn up to 14 points. And I'm going to let uh, Lindsay kind of walk us through as well as some of the education uh, attributes on, on ISI's incredible continuing education uh, program that they have as well. And I think other use cases that um, we spoke to earlier, just from a, a benchmarking and um, analytics side, these analytics are, are especially useful in um, sort of city uh, sustainability and, and real estate benchmarking systems. And, and I think more and more we're seeing from a investment standpoint, institutional investors more and more interested in uh, the, the context of ESG, environmental social governance investing and impact investing. Here's a way with these analytics to measure those impacts. And, and we're seeing that pick up in, in the investment world as well and supported um, as we've spoken um, billions of dollars in, in federal grant applications that require these analytics. So um, maybe Lindsay, I'll hand it back to you to cover some of the, uh, the ISI side things. Sure, so I'm happy to share some more information um, from the, the within the Envision framework. And I think uh, as we saw earlier on this webinar today from Anthony's examples, Envision users are really able to address the full spectrum of economic aspects of their projects with comprehensive use of the Envision framework. Um, the framework also recognizes that while not all of our infrastructure projects are directly tied to economic growth specifically. They do um, and are connected to the economy, economy by either driving um, community attractiveness or looking at environmental responsibility. So you'll see throughout the Envision framework that the credits provide guidance on how to balance all three of these aspects. And that's, that's what we've been talking about this morning in terms of balancing and accounting for all of the benefits across the triple bottom line. So specifically within the Envision framework, I did want to highlight uh, one credit that provides us, provides more specific guidance for the evaluation um, and economic anal analyses that we've been discussing today. Uh, so as Eric referenced, this is LD 3.3, which encourages our project teams to conduct life cycle economic evaluations. So for this credit, we provide incentives for using economic analysis to provide better me measurement of the value of a project and ultimately encourage greater levels of sustainability. To kind of take a, a closer look at the, what we call the levels of achievement for this credit. So ways that you can earn uh, points, um, the points serve as incentives for expanding on uh, on how you are uh, using your life cycle economic evaluation. So in this, in this credit here, we recognize life cycle cost analyses are really foundational for ensuring that the project is assessing capital operations and management, replacement costs, and residual value for all of the alternatives across the full life cycle. Here in this credit, we provide guidance and further in incentives for expanding on the LCCA to also map broader benefits and complete a full sustainability cost benefit analysis to really better inform your project decisions. So I wanted to uh, show a demo of a course that we have. So this is, uh, um, so beyond this credit, beyond the Envision guidance manual, we're also able to provide some extensive information and ISI is expanding our resources to include um, educational courses on critical, critical topics such as life cycle cost uh, evaluations. Uh, one such course we have developed with AutoCase, and that's what I'm going to demo for you here briefly. Um, uh, Eric Bill, my co-presenter for this uh, presentation, was the, uh, authored this course, course, and I wanted to share this as a demo with you so that you can kind of see what you'd be able to access from within your ISI account and some of these additional uh, resources that we are, that ISI is preparing for you. So here we have the Sustainable and Resilient Infrastructure Economics course. You can see it's, it's fully interactive and engaging course. Our course author, Eric Bill, is listed here. Hey, same, About, same sweater too. Hey, great. <laughs> <laughs> you match your headshot, that's always good. Um, 
our, our uh, lesson plan here walks through kind of the fundamentals and theory behind cost benefit analysis. So a lot of the questions that we've been seeing coming through on the webinar today on how do you account for uh, social impacts? How do you measure the, the environmental impacts? That's all laid out here um, throughout the, the lessons that we have provided in this, this course. Um, Jim, uh, Jim had previously mentioned the Monte Carlo analysis. Um, that is something that I learned about by developing this course with course author Eric Phil. I can say that the bulk of what I've learned about economics has been from Eric Phil. So you are in good hands with this course and what you will be able to learn with this course. I uh, wanted to share with you a little bit more through this demo about how it's um, interactively, we think of these as kind of like an interactive article. So something that you can do um, whether it's on your commute, while you're spending some time uh, working remotely, fully engaged um, with some different activities that you can, can complete to kind of test your new skills and learning. Um, we also provide, again, additional information specifically on LD 3.3, conducting a life cycle economic evaluation. So you'll be able to use this course to walk through our full uh, in Envision V3 credit, so being able to learn more about what does it mean to reach the improved level of achievement? What about enhanced? And you know, what does it take to really get to the restorative level of achievement? So uh, just wanting to highlight that as an additional tool, um, additional resource that you have available to you. To access that, you can log into your ISI account through sustainableinfrastructure.org. From your dashboard, you would click on your education page. Hmm get logged out, log back in real quickly. And then uh, from your education page, everybody should have access to this all courses library we, where you can see kind of our latest and greatest resources that we have available for you, um, including that course. So here is our sustainable and resilient infrastructure economics uh, course for you. And so you can kind of see the full range of additional resources that we have available. Uh, so that is what I wanted to highlight from the Envision side. I think uh, Eric's got some great information to share, kind of mirroring from the, the lead in USGBC side of things. So Eric, please. Hey, thanks for running us through that, Lindsay. So I'm gonna share the, the lead side, first of all, um, when I, I first saw the outcome of all the effort, I, I couldn't believe what a great job uh, Lindsay and her team had, had done in um, you know, converting that to an online, um, e course, and you know, in this day and age, um, I think the the timing's ripe for um, that that way to learn as well. So, kudos to uh, to you, Lindsay, and, and ISI as well for that content. So, we've got um, you know just quickly wanted to share what you know what the similar context and on the lead side is, and uh, you know we do support um, a number of uh, architecture firms and real estate owners, developers, and municipalities. In, in the built environment side of things. So helping on the, the vertical infrastructure where leads applicable, as opposed to the, the horizontal infrastructure, mostly where um, Envision's focused on, though um, in, in the case that I'll provide an example, it was the um, LaGuardia redevelopment as well, and, and that was on a, a building. So I'll, I'll share some of those insights. But just from uh, the USGBC, lead credit perspective, really there's two innovation credits that, that can be earned and, and really where we support uh, architects and, and building owners really in, again, helping to denote which investments drive the, the greatest bang for their buck or which ones yield benefits and to, to what extent towards the uh, building occupants in terms of productivity, health outcome, implications, uh, absenteeism impacts and, and utility savings, those sorts of things. and. Uh, specifically for leagues, and I'm really, uh, and I've provided the links here, if, if you're in the space and are interested, um, you know, really need to submit approval for the credits. Um, in, in the case of the first credit, need to focus on three specific credits, indoor water use, outdoor water use, and optimized energy performance. So that's water and energy uh, considerations, really focus on that, and then garner um, other credits outside of those three core, but really it's six credits, so a cross section, and you build the business case towards those investments that have been made under the, the name of those credits. And the second credit really is, is very similar. It's just retweaked a little bit here, um, where you need to select two credits from 
at least two distinct uh, lead credit categories so that in aggregate they add up to, to six credits specifically. So, you know, essentially it's a way to, to reframe things, um, basically the, you know, the same context, but in both cases by conducting a rigorous triple bottom line cost benefit analysis can earn you points towards your submissions. And, and we've seen this in uh, numerous examples. And I do have one example. It's the, the only one to my knowledge uh, where both credits for LEED and for Envision have been earned in, in a project. And this is um, the LaGuardia redevelopment. So in, in, in Ryan Prime, maybe just a heads up, I might ask you for, uh, for some insights because we, we worked with Skanska and, and HOK and supported some of the, the great work that, that uh, they were involved in on this particular project. But for those who, who aren't familiar with it, it's you know, roughly an $8 billion in aggregate redevelopment program, um, absolutely needed. Um, and uh, amazing in its, its breadth, uh, the Terminal B project that we were involved in, uh, it's the largest P3 project um, in the aviation market at just over $5 billion. So you know, the absolute scale here is unbelievable and significant investments in sustainability, resilience, and all the other things that, that come with building a world-class uh, airport um, have been integrated into, into the project. And in this case, it was a, an Envision Platinum recipient, so that the highest level of Envision and also earned uh, lead silver as well. And so really, um, as part of the, the broader design work that was involved here, we, we stepped in towards the end of the project and, and evaluated a few of the interesting aspects. So on the lead side, a selection of, of those six various credits to build the, the case and enumerate the value that was being generated within some of those design elements, which helped them uh, earn that uh, point as well. And on the Envision side, really focusing on, uh, in this case, a cool roof and the outcomes provided within. And Orion, any, anything else to, to add here without uh, putting you on the spot? Hey Eric, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey. Um, I, I would just add that, uh, you know, hats off to the auto case team. We, we worked well together, um, had a couple of, of interesting WebEx where you guys walked us through the process. Uh, also hats off to WSP and HOK who are, um, our design joint venture partners on that project. And really the, the auto case process, as you mentioned, came in a little late in our design only because we got to jump start years ahead to make sure we were meeting our milestones. But it, it, it did happen at a very interesting point where we were able to almost put a bow on a lot of the design decisions that we were able to make um, and to show the benefits. So, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't leverage the analysis as much as we could have in terms of decision making, but it was able to put a bow on the decisions that we did make to show the benefits, if that makes sense. Sounds good. Hey, th thanks for that. And it was, um, it was our pleasure to, to be involved and, and to support the work that you were involved in as well. Um, so maybe just jumping to, to the results. And of course, I want to be cognizant of, of our time today, but um, on the Envision side, are really our work focusing on the on the cool roof. So, um, you know, certainly there's um, an intent with these roofs. It's to um, increase the reflectivity, reduce the the thermal load on on the building. So you you drive um, a broad based set of outcomes. So the the core one, of course, is to reduce uh, energy use and the the EUI side of things as well, and the heating and cooling loads. In, in this particular case, quite a substantial size roof, 541,000 square feet. And what we did was, was build that incremental case towards what a, a conventional roof would be um, at a, a SRI, solar reflectivity index 79, against this cool roof, um, higher value, took that long-term study period. And we looked at those um, future uh, climate change implications. So, you know, something that is, um, you know, becoming more widespread and certainly we're uh, proponents for it, but to include these different climate change scenarios. So in this case, uh, uh, RCP 8.5 and looking at how temperature increases in the specific region 
into the future, taking best available science, marrying that with economics, looking at, well, what are the implications on a utility standpoint over this long-term study period? What are those long-term trade-offs against the, the costs with the cool roof? But also there are broader implications like urban heat island reduction and uh, health implications. So reduction in, uh, in mortalities and, and we're taking um, you know, this very site specific weather data. Um, again, you know, track over 5,000 weather stations around North America. Uh, look at this historical dates projected in the future with climate change. And we can determine um, the incremental area around this site, how much that uh, ambient temperature gets reduced because of the cool roof. And we can apply these health economics valuations to determine what that benefit is. So it's kind of an interesting project, you know, sort of, oh, it's, it's just a roof project. But at the end of the day, there's a whole um, breadth of benefits that, that comes with it as well. And, you know, something like uh, $400,000 in, in net present value for this particular project. On the lead side, so essentially, um, again, if we can focus the credits included in this project, this is sort of an automated snapshot from, um, from our software and you know, identify that there are six credits that we value, the optimized energy, construction, IEQ management plan, uh, low emitting materials, that um, cool roof I mentioned, heat island reduction, indoor and outdoor water use reduction. And you know, when we look at the top here, we can see what that business case is, the financial and, and the broader social environmental implications to the project, actually in both cases is driving substantive value. So across the six lead credit checklists, as Ryan mentioned, you know, did substantiate the innovative design that the team had put towards this project. Um, you know, this cross section of credits driving about $15 million in financial benefits, financial savings over the life of it, plus the reduction emissions, the conservation of fresh water, the um, reduction mortalities uh, drove that fairly substantial $24 million roughly net present value here as well. And we did a, a per um, point net present value. And, and here's some of the um, kind of breakdowns between uh, what we're framing in stakeholders, the owner and occupant and the broader community. And especially in a, in a, in a P3 environment, um, you know, I think identifying which stakeholders benefit and to what extent um, certainly is a, an important consideration as well. So, you know, all in all, able to support um, some of the additional credits on the Envision and on the, the lead side. And it was just great to be involved in such a, a massive project. And, and I think since since then, our first work at LAX and SFO um, support LaGuardia, um, it's been great to support the broader aviation industry and, and folks like Carrie and Jim uh, doing their great work. So I think that's uh, sort of it on on my end. Maybe Lindsay, pass it back to you. Great, know, thank you so much for that. Go ahead, Lindsay. Oh, I was going to say we did have a question come in over the over the chat, Eric. If you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to answer this. So, over the course of this webinar. Um, We've seen a lot of great snapshots from the analytical software. Are you able to share um, how that is available for users? And um, as we talked about some additional resources for training for um, uh, resources for training, can you talk about what kind of training is needed to get up to speed on use of that analytical software? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the, the case studies shown today are sort of twofold. One, our analytics um, from project evaluations that are from the software uh, so that architects, engineers, planners, owners can, can use themselves. Others uh, were more bespoke um, economic advisory based projects where our team of economists had supported the work directly. So sort of a, a mix there, but on, on the software side, autocase.com is, is our website. And um, you know, really um, there are some tutorials and, and other content that I can uh, that I can send the team, but you know, it's it's all designed to be a, a, a relatively light lift for for non-technical uh, folks or non-economists. Uh, and then where projects become more complex, that's where our team comes in to, to leverage and, and provide support. 
Uh, great, Eric. Thank you very much. We're, we're getting close to the end of our planned session, but I want to remind everyone we're going to go to 1215 for questions and answers. I, I want to thank Eric and Shane and Anthony, Carrie, Jim, and of course, Lindsay, uh, for sharing with us today. Each of you did a terrific job. There are lots of exciting projects to learn from and uh, plenty more behind those. So this morning you learned about the importance of making the case for sustainable buildings and infrastructure. You learned about the use of TBL CBA. You learned about the intersection between envision and economic assessments, the use of economics to justify specific design scenarios, and how you can get training that you need to fulfill the envision 3.0 LD 3.3 maximum points for economic assessment. You also heard questions as to how uh, they, you can apply these tools on behalf of your projects. Uh, I want to encourage you, again, to stay with us for a few more minutes, ask more questions. If you can, include your email address. We'd be happy if we don't get your question during the call, we'd like to reach out to you and answer it that way. Uh, lastly, you've been called to the use of arms of our professions, including the information we've shared today to do what is good, what is right, and what is responsible in exchange for project funding. You've been called to be able to explain who shares in the costs and benefits associated with your projects. And you've been called to explain when those benefits will accrue. So if nothing else, consider that call to arms a coping mechanism to give you something to focus on while you're locked up and waiting for the pandemic wave to pass. So if you have to leave the call now, please join us this afternoon at 2 p.m. for webinar number two, and tomorrow at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. for webinars number three and four. We promise they'll be worth your while. Uh, also, as Joan said at the beginning of the call, if you, if you need to speak with someone in this difficult time, feel free to reach out to Joan, feel free to reach out to me. We'll, we'll help you in any way we possibly can. So I wanna thank everybody again. Let's go to questions and then we'll just run so 12, 15 or whenever the questions run out. And I'm gonna go back um, into some of the questions that we weren't able to quite get answered. I'll see if I can get some that were uh, kind of bigger picture and kind of so that we can get a range of our folks uh, speaking to them. Um, so can we talk, uh, so through these examples, uh, we've seen kind of different examples of different organizations that are making use of triple bottom line cost benefit analysis, including um, public policy on the parts of either federal, state, and municipal governments. So are there any organizations that make it their own mandate to push for greater uptake by the governments? Um, many governments are reluctant to lead and they're eager to see what other public bodies are doing. So are you aware, John, or any of our, our speakers on any groups taking such action? Well, I'll offer one thought, and Mike Sanyo, you might want to straighten me out on this. I know uh, in addition to working with ISI, we're as Eric said earlier, we're working with uh, AIA, we're working with USGBC, and uh, we work with Mike Sanyo's team at uh, AS, excuse me, the American Society of Professional Engineers to provide training for the civil engineering community. Uh, I know that there's a move afoot amongst the investment community to require more in-depth review of value of public benefit that I'll be talking about in webinar number four tomorrow afternoon. So suggest that you tune into that. Others have uh, contributions here? Eric? Well, I was gonna say, I'm gonna keep quiet here, maybe um, what, what Carrie yep. might have for insights here. Not to put you on the spot. No, 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 it's okay. If I understood, can, Lindsay, the question was about um, whether there are organizations committed to advocating for requirements of this? Is that the gist of the question? I think that's the gist of the question. Either organizations or other public sector um, 
organizations and agencies that are knowingly pushing for um, for uh, for new policies. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely seen a big, um, and I don't want to name uh, particular names just in case uh, there's politics at hand here, but sure. um, I, I have seen an uptick for sure in uh, transit agencies looking at this um, pretty closely to, to, you know, they tend to be limited um, budget and resources um, and are looking at uh, life cycle cost analysis, uh, total cost of ownership, triple bottom line cost benefit analysis. In terms of advocating at a higher level for sort of mandating this, I mean, my initial thought was actually ISI. I think that you guys um, do a lot of uh, a lot of advocating, um, especially given uh, you know proximity to uh, federal level there in DC. So I mean, I, I don't know if uh, not to pass the buck on this question, but I think um, you know you or Anthony speaking to how you've been advocating for not just more sustainable infrastructure investment, um, but specifically how, you know, the, the, this particular financial analysis uh, plays a role in that. <laughs> now I'm passing it to put you guys on the spot. But. Not at all. <laughs> Well, yeah, I would say on that one, we, we take the approach, this is Anthony, uh, we take the approach that we often find that the biggest counter argument to sustainability or the challenge to sustainability is this uh, perception of cost. So I think where the economic analysis can be really valuable is just giving all of us the tools to combat those perceptions and to actually demonstrate in a very real way uh, that the sustainable solution um, almost always has the better financial uh, argument. And so that's where we really see uh, and why we advocate for this so strongly is uh, trying to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're knocking down uh, these arguments against sustainability. I, I want to add that the, the goal here is to provide our customers or asset owners with the best information they can pop, possibly have so they make good decisions. It's not, the goal is not to greenwash things. It's, it's to basically present the data as it is and then let them move forward and make the right decisions. I'd also add that the, uh, in terms of the movement toward this type of analysis, probably the largest stormwater management entity in the United States uh, is emphasizing triple bottom line cost benefit analysis. There's also a major community redevelopment project uh, on the West Coast, a multi-billion dollar project that is mandating green results, but triple bottom line cost benefit analysis to actually measure and report and monitor those results. And then finally, uh, this uh, TBL CBA has found, certainly found a home in the aviation community with, I believe, I know we have about 16 aviation facilities around North America that are using TBL CBA. And I know that at least one of them has mandated it in their P3 procurements. So uh, I think you're, the, the wave is going to increase again as their demands for transparency as to how public dollars are really being spent. Who is benefiting from these investments and how and how much? So I think uh, I think we've got a a possibly challenging question um, up, but it's a it's a good segue slash follow up uh, for kind of this discussion, and I think our speakers are up to the task for answering a somewhat challenging question. So um, if I may, John. Uh, so we have a question coming in. So using triple bottom line to justify a project. Can it itself be challenging when, when the project sponsor, sponsors are, are really focused on the initial costs and also who is and who view all estimated soft costs with, you know, are, are somewhat suspicious of them and they're kind of scrutinizing all of the, the soft costs of the project. So how, how can uh, we tackle this challenge and how can, we, um, how can we continue to advocate use of, uh, of these, these softwares where the, the benefits may seem to accrue to um, what would be seen as third parties who are, who are not um, ultimately helping pay for the project itself. Yeah, I wanna start out with that. Uh, first of all, it's all about transparency and, and documentation. And uh, we as a, a group of analysts do not assign a number to anything. 
that we can't back up with documentation and sources of research, et cetera. And we learned this from years and years of doing custom studies where we were met with skepticism when we made certain claims of value. And we understood that we would be challenged every single time we presented. So AutoCase or the software or the analysis you've seen on the, the screen today, uh, acts, it functions like an onion. If you peel back the layers of an onion to its very core, you can see what the onion is made of. And that's what we do with our economic analysis. We provide so much documentation that there's little doubt as to how these numbers were uh, calculated by the time you get into the tool. And I, I would add that, by the way, often the alternative is that we say, yes, there are, ex there are uh, benefits that are uh, intangible, but important. And those benefits tend to get shoved to the side or discounted if, if more work isn't done. And often those are the benefits that are the reasons why we deliver our projects in the first place. And so, you know, what is better, a thoroughly documented economic analysis or a blank piece of paper? And, and also one other point I'll add is that often, I mean, the, the asset owner may say, look, I'm paying the bill and why should I worry about external benefits? Well, for example, every asset is located in a host community and the community may not pay the bill, but the community controls what you can do on your site and what it expects in return for the right to conduct that activity. And often you can use this type of economic analysis as a form of political currency or social currency that can be swapped between the asset owner, the asset occupiers or users, and the host community so that everybody wins and gains value. Eric, did I miss anything there? No, I think you hit the nail on the head, John. Nothing really to add too much. I think you know we're, we're taking the, the best most rigorous process and um, you know in, in cases where it fits with the software automating it with technology and in other cases bringing that additional level of sophistication so i mean we're really using the the global standard uh, gold standard for for analysis here and that's how i'd advocate it to uh, to the market i'll just, I'll just uh, oh sorry go ahead shane no just just quickly to continue the auto case monopoly here um one of the, I think the more compelling things about Anthony's presentation was that a lot of times these sort of co-benefits that we think of as soft costs generally do have a real cost manifestation. And you saw when he kind of attributed the, the flood costs and benefits to each of the individual um, bureaucrat or bureaucracies inside of the stormwater management aspects that they do realize these costs. And you can think of this uh, on a site context, but also in a building context. I mean, um, the amount of money that you spend on occupants is significant and much more significant than what you spend on the building. And you can realize real savings by investing in things that help building occupants. So sometimes these soft costs are actually not soft costs and we're just not taking those into account. Yeah, and I was just gonna add, and, <clears throat> and I echo um, Shane, your comments on, on the, the points that Anthony brought up before. Um, and that John was mentioning here again, the that kind of shared cost and benefit uh, conversation uh, can be really valuable, particularly getting over that initial hump. Um, but I think one of the things that I heard in that question, and maybe I'm reading into it because um, I'm sensitive to this, is just the cost of doing this type of analysis in and of itself um, and the concern that might be raised among um, particular project owners or agencies uh, looking to make this case but realizing that you know this might be an additional cost to their project um, to even just use this tool or do the analysis and i would just encourage folks to consider um, at least piloting this on a, a few projects to start to get that dialogue going internally um, to start to understand and demonstrate uh, the value proposition of some of these types of investments because then those will presumably carry over um, to other projects and other decisions that need to be made. Um, so if I'm not off base in, in reading into that aspect of the question, um, I would just, I would encourage folks to make us at least an upfront um, small investment in, in doing this type of analysis on, on even some small pilot projects um, to uh, get that dialogue started and that understanding started uh, internally.
And uh, this is Jim Grant. I would add a couple of items on the two examples I shared with you today. On the reclaimed water, it's the cost of potable water is, is only going to go up. And so that just made total economic sense to do that. And then on the sanitary sewer side, it's the cost of you know, potentially a spillover, right? Because they, once all the sewage ends up in the plant, it has to go somewhere. It can't be just kept there because it's going to end up overflowing and where does it overflow? So there's the fines and then there's the social ill will that comes with that, right? Uh, that are our direct expenses. And so yes, third parties benefit, but the client themselves benefit. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Lindsay, we're actually at uh, 19 minutes after the hour. I well, I'm reluctant to do this. We promised to wrap up by a quarter after we're four minutes over. I, I think I just want to thank everybody again for joining us. Please tune in to uh, the other three webinars. I think they'll be uh, just as rich in content. We'll all benefit. Great. Thank you so much. All right, folks, this does conclude today's presentation. Please be sure to join us this afternoon. And until next time, thank you all for being leaders in the infrastructure industry as we work to build a more sustainable future. Thank you. Good day. Thank you all. Very good.